Um. <laughs> yeah. So, and uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, Anders Drage. Uh, he works for uh, Statoil. Uh, he uh, has a PhD uh, in petroleum geophysics from the University in Bergen. Uh, has been in Statoil since 2006. Um, mainly in exploration, but also in research. Uh, focus of his work has been to link geology, uh, geological processes, to seismic properties. So, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about uh, automated fluid substitution from nonlinear regression. And uh, first, uh, I will just mention the main takeaways from the presentation before I go into fluid substitution and why we do it and some background. And uh, I'm going to show a new method for uh, fluid uh, substitution. That's called rock physics fluid uh, substitution. And uh, I will show how we can automate uh, this to make it very rapid and efficient. And I will show some results and uh, applications for the technology. So. Uh, the first takeaway is that we have a new method for fluid substitution. Gassman has been the standard for in the industry since the 1950s, so more than a half a century. And uh, so this is uh, something that maybe can challenge uh, Gassman in some instances. And uh, here we have uh, also a way of automating it, so, uh, so it can be performed very efficiently and, uh, and uh, fast. So uh, fluid substitution. Uh, we had, uh, in 2017, it was reported that we had drilled more than 6,000 wells on the Norwegian continental shelf. And as you can see uh, below here, the, the result was uh, varying. We had uh, some uh, oil discovery, gas discovery, condensate, and some brine. And, of course, it's very expensive to drill all these wells. So, before we drill, we really would like to know what does success look like, what does a failure look like. And uh, the... the what we look at is the seismic. So we need to know what does oil look like on seismic, what does brine and uh, gas look like on seismic. So in exploration, it's really important that we can model these things so we have an idea about what we're looking for. Uh, so, so we use it for modeling the target reflectivity. We can use it in seismic inversion and uh, amplitude versus angle. And basically, it can influence the whole drill or drop decision in an exploration target. So these uh, plots here just shows that in the elastic domains here you have intercept gradient uh, plot in, uh, which is related to amplitude versus angle. Uh, brine, oil and gas uh, can really stand out from each other and ha have a l large impact on the seismic properties. Uh, we can go down and we can uh, model a brine case and a gas case and we can compare it with, uh, with the real seismic here. Uh, when we're doing reservoir monitoring in a producing field, you can uh, monitor the fluid mov movement when one fluid is replaced with another by a fluid substitution. And when you have control on the fluid, you can also uh, get better control on the pressure effects. And uh, it can basically uh, aid in uh, increased oil recovery. So um, as I mentioned, Gasman has been the standard in the industry since the 50s. And uh, the procedure of Gasman is uh, can be uh, illustrated like this. You have a rock with a given fluid, and then you calculate the properties of this rock without anything at all in the pores. And then you calculate the properties when you fill in new fluid in the pore. So uh, the equation looks like this. I'm not going to go through that in detail. But you use uh, different uh, input, from, uh, mainly from uh, well logs. Uh, I color the S-wave velocity here with uh, orange because many wells, you don't have as wave velocity, so you need to do some kind of estimation maybe, and that will also increase the uncertainty in the prediction. Uh, the solid rock bulk modulus, or the mineral bulk modulus, is an input, and that's something you rarely have control over. Normally you don't have a homogeneous uh, reservoir with only one mineral, you have various minerals, and you need to have an uh, estimation of the affective uh, incompressibility of that. So that can be an uncertainty in Gassman modeling. Uh, and then uh, you, you can calculate the, the, the 
incompressibility of the rock for the new fluid, like shown down here. So that's, that's Gassman. Uh, the new uh, suggestion here is, uh, is based on, uh, you see up here you have p y velocity versus porosity for a reservoir sun with hydrocarbons in the pore. So this is the uh, well log data. And uh, what I do is that I take a rock physics model that is suited for this uh, geology. So, so, so the geology might have some impact uh, here, or a geologist might be a good uh, person to consult with before you start this, so you know that, for instance, this is a sun. Uh, you calibrate the rock physics model, and on that calibrated rock physics model, I perform my fluid substitution. So then I get this new data here, the red one. They are the fluid substituted data on my uh, rock physics model. And uh, I can use Gassman for that, or I can use something else. Uh, and then I look at the difference between the red and the yellow dots here, which is the fluid effect up in the right corner here. The, this is the P-wave velocity for the brine filled rock minus the P-wave velocity for the hydrocarbon filled rock. And you see the fluid effect is uh, up to around 100 meter per second here, but it seems to decrease with porosity. Um, then I use this uh, calculated fluid effect and apply it on the original data. And then I get the, my fluid substituted data. So I use the original uh, PY velocity plus the modeled fluid uh, effect. Uh, and I apply that on the original data. And you can show that in another domain as well uh, as a function of original uh, brine saturation. When you had uh, brine to start with in the rock, you will, of course, not get any change when you, get, when you fluid substitute the brine. But the more hydrocarbons you get here in the start phase, you get a larger fluid effect here. Uh, the way to automate this, if you're going to do this manually, it would be very uh, labor intensive and it would not be a very uh, smart way of working. But uh, you can do this automatically. Oops. Uh, the, the, by, by looking at the P wave velocity, I need to introduce some uh, rock physics here. Uh, that's dependent on the incompressibility of the rock and the shear modulus of the rock and the density. And the incompressibility of the rock is the uh, resistance of being compressed when you uh, have an uh, out of pressure on your rock. And uh, if you have uh, gas in the pores, it's easier to compress your rock than if you have brine in your pores. So the incompressibility increases when you put brine in the pore instead of gas. Uh, and we have different uh, rock physics models that can calculate this affective uh, incompressibility. I'm going to show a very simple model here, but you can use, in this approach, you can use uh, any rock physics models. And, uh, and here is the equation for estimating the affective incompressibility for the dry rock. Uh, these two green uh, colored uh, parameters here is the porosity and the pressure. They can be derived from the well logs normally. Uh, and then you have some other parameters that is not that obvious. Uh, you have the coordination number here, or, which is uh, often called the grain contacts. So you, the number of grain contacts per grain in the rock. And you have the shear modulus and the Poisson ratio of the minerals in your rock. And the Poisson ratio is a function of the bulk modulus or incompressibility and shear modulus of the minerals together with a uh, V shale log, which, which is the fraction of shale in your rock. The V shale can normally be derived from uh, your well log, and uh, the other ones are not known uh, exactly normally, but you have an upper and lower limit of what you can expect. So these parameters can be optimized to fit your data with a nonlinear uh, regression. Uh, so, so what I basically do is that I have uh, a porosity P-Y velocity uh, plot, and I have sands, and I have shales, and I have everything in between, and I would like my rock physics model to represent the points in that uh, domain. And uh, it's quite similar to traditional machine learning approaches, where I have a, a cloud of data, and I might, might use a linear or a nonlinear model, and just trying to fit those data. So, so I'm... I'm uh, playing around and, and oops, with, uh, with, uh, with these uh, parameters within uh, physical constraints. So I know that my result is physically physical sensible. And, uh, and I try to match my rock physics model. 
And when I have all these parameters here, and I, I have a model that I'm happy with, uh, I actually have the input to the Gassman model. I have the, the, the bulk and shear modulus of the solids, so I can apply that in a Gassman model. And that makes a uh, large difference if I do it in this way than applying the Gassman uh, directly, because now I have consistency between all the parameters since I'm using a rock physics model. So comparing this approach with Gassman, uh, on the y-axis here, this is the fluid effect going from hydrocarbon to a brine filled rock. And we see that Gassman, which is the gray dots here, have a really large fluid effect. Even if the porosity is approaching zero, you get a really high fluid effect with Gassman. But the, the Roth's approach is approaching zero when you're going towards zero porosity. Uh, the color on the Roth's, oops, Roth's approach is the saturation here. So blue value has a high hydrocarbon saturation and low brine saturation originally before we fluid substitute. So, so, so in this example, it's more likely that we will not have a really large fluid effect when we hardly have any porosity left in the rock. Uh, if we increase the porosity, and looking at the sand, st sand reservoir here, uh, the ROFS approach and the Gassman is quite similar, uh, and we see a decreasing fluid effect while porosity is uh, decreasing. If we increase the porosity even further and look at another uh, reservoir here, uh, we see that it's almost overlap between the two approaches, and we have very large similarity here. And uh, if, if we look at the, the velocity porosity domain instead here, we have Gassman as gray dots uh, in the background, and colored uh, data is the Roth's approach, and they're almost overlapping completely when you have this high porosity data. Uh, and finally, I would like to show a plot with uh, carbonates, because this new approach can also include rock physics model for carbonates that honor the microtexture in carbonates with fractures and different pore shapes. Uh, Gassman is not accounting for that, so it's known to struggle in many cases with carbonates. So, uh, so you see here, the scale is really large here because the Gassman is predicting some incredibly high fluid sensitivity for some data, and here it, it, it predicts incredibly low fluid sensitivity, actually a negative fluid sensitivity while uh, the ROFS model is more stable and, and giving more uh, moderate results here. Uh, so I applied this for uh, 480 wells. It took me a few minutes just to run automatically. And uh, I compared with Gassman substitution in all these wells. So uh, the x-axis here is the, is the mean uh, deviation of uh, fluid effect between the ROFS model and the Gassman. So a positive value here means that we have a larger fluid effect in the Roth's model, and uh, a negative value means that we have a larger fluid effect in the Gassman model. So these are averages per well. Uh, so, so each number up here is one well. And uh, we see that most of the data are within plus minus 100 meter per second. But if we split this up into oil data, uh, we see that oil is more consistent. The stipple line here is the average for all the oil data, and it's almost exactly at zero. So, so the, the average deviation is, uh, is zero, if you take the average of all. Uh, and uh, most of the data are within plus or minus 50 meter per second, which is not bad. For gas, the deviation is larger. It's uh, mostly constrained between uh, plus or minus 100 meter per second. Uh, so uh, I was wondering when I, was so, when I saw this, why, why do we have some large deviation? Is my model performing bad, or is it Gassman, or is it the data that's the problem? So I went into some of these anomalies, and, uh, and I saw that you could use this approach also as a QC of your data. So uh, I saw, for instance, in one well here, that the data showed for a clean sandstone. It was a very low v shell value for all these uh, blue data here in the porosity velocity domain. And when porosity is decreasing, you have not any uh, velocity increase at all. And that's really counterintuitive. So something tells me that there must be something wrong with this data, either the velocity or the porosity log, or at least you must have some weird lithology, that lithological change with porosity that the well logs doesn't capture. So here I can go back to my petrophysicist and say that can you take a look at this data? I, they, I can't find any rock physics model that can, 
can uh, be calibrated to this at least. So, so this will of course lead me to, to a large uh, deviation in the fluid prediction when my rock physics model doesn't work. Uh, other examples, <coughs> uh, here my, the ROFS model is predicting a decreasing fluid uh, effect with uh, decreasing porosity, while Gassman is, uh, is, is consistent at uh, high porosity, but at lower porosity Gassman is actually increasing the fluid uh, effect uh, quite dramatically, uh, which is counterintuitive, and it could be some lithological effects here, but that is not present in the well logs. Uh, and I see that in, in some of the examples here. And I think it's, uh, it's a little uh, unexpected behavior of the, the Gassman prediction here at least. So I would uh, at least say that there are some suspicious logs here to my petrophysicist and uh, ask them to take another look at this because we have such large deviations. And uh, sometimes I can immediately say that the well logs are wrong because uh, they, they say that we, they, they model the the fluid effect with, uh, from hydrocarbons to brine, but the velocities are exactly the same and you don't see any uh, fluid effect in the logs, even if the, the pore fluid has changed. So there I can uh, just report that this log is actually not uh, a good log. So to sum up this, uh, I've uh, presented a new uh, method for fluid substitution that's called uh, rock physics fluid substitution. And it seems to handle low porosity cases uh, where Gassman conditions are not uh, met, better than maybe Gassman is able to, to handle this. And it's uh, really fit for automation, this uh, method. It can perform fluid substitution in hundreds of wells in just a few minutes. And um, uh, it can be used as automatic uh, quality control, both of the well logs and of the fluid substitution in wells that already has fluid substitution. Uh, new wells can be QC'd and fluid substitution substituted at a very early stage. So this can, this can go automatically whenever you have the, the input from your uh, well logs. So this has a uh, large potential for both cost and uh, time saving. So, thank you. Thank you to Anders and Equinor. Uh, questions? Yes, Per, I expected that. <laughs> I had that, Thanks for a very good talk, uh, Anders. Um, one question. Uh, have you looked into, or could you do the similar approach on st stress sensitivities? And which model would you pick use in your algorithm then? Like in a 40, you would look uh, at we'll both. Go for your model, of course. Good, okay, that's what I was going to develop the startup. <laughs> yeah. Another quick question, uh, what about scale effects of the saturation, patchy versus uh, uniform saturation? Does yeah. your, do you handle that in your algorithm? No, we don't, uh, we don't uh, pay attention to that, we just uh, assume a uniform. But uh, if, if you have specific knowledge about that, you can, you can use a patchy saturation uh, fluid mm -hmm. substitution model. Thanks. Yeah.